I believe the camera is not something you're seeing through. It's the way your body extends into life. Manny Cao, born 1944, died 2011. Before Manny Cao, Indian cinema hinged on a binary between the fantastical excess of mainstream Bollywood and the austere realism of art house legend Satyajit Ray. Cao's first film, Uski Roti, 1969, tells the story of a woman who walks several miles out of her village every day to bring roti, bread, for her bus driver husband. It's a particular kind of bread, it's like made of flour and water. And it looked like sourdough to me. Oh, come on. The gesture is largely unappreciated. The camera waits with her, gazing across the grass, the smoke of the bus, the kneading of the roti, both kinds of need. His most famous film, Duvida, recounts a Rajasthani folktale about a ghost who seduces a married woman while her husband is away on business. His first film in colour, it uses a refined creamy orange palette and an unorthodox use of stills. Manny Cal's oeuvre spans documentary, erotica, and psychological drama, unapologetically modern but always drawing on tradition, whether it be Hindu ceramics in his luscious docupoem Mind of Clay, or the literature of Dostoevsky in The Idiot and Nazar. Stylistically, he balanced the influence of French purist Bresson with a reverence for his naturalistic mentor, Ritvik Guttak. Nazar, made in 1991, is a tragic chamber piece. Shimmering with reds and greens, it tells the story of a doomed romance between an antique dealer and his much younger orphan wife. Stories of devoted women suffering the vagaries of wayward men, scintillating cinematography and editing with an experimental edge. Is this the quintessential Moob Tube director? <laughs> As ever, joining me to discuss this and more is Owen Vince. Owen, were you wowed by oh, Cal? Wowed by Cal. I'm, I'm cowering from his prowess. <laughs> These past few weeks have been quite bizarre. This was a really good, like being introduced to Cal was really good for me, just psychologically good for mm. me, emotionally good for me, because it was a bit of a bath. Mm. Because they are such like rhythmically sensuous films, mm. kind of short. Um, it, it's like time capsules almost. They're amazing, like emotional capsules, whatever. Um, and it was perfect, yeah, because it just had like the weirdest, weirdest kind of like flat line of a week, a couple of weeks. And this mm -hmm. is just like a shot in the arm for mm. uh, just remembering on a pure, we were talking about surfaces before, but talking on a pure surface level and pure aesthetics, just like being able to watch 90 minutes or something that's exceptionally beautiful. It's such a treat. Mm. It's so good. I can't, we can't, it's like, we can't lose sight of that, I guess. But there's two, right? There's two really good. Manikau, I'm sure there's more. There's two really good Manikau anecdotes, mm -hmm. right? So one is Manikau, we're going to talk about auteurs probably, yeah. maybe, I don't know. But I, I find it difficult to talk about Manikau without talking about his like context and what he was engaging with and responding to. Mm. Um, he studied at the Indian Institute for Film and Television, mm. IAFT, which Gatak um, taught at, was heading up in the... Uh, 60s, thought late, yeah, late 50s and 60s when uh, when um, Cal was kind of starting out in film, um, and he does his first um, he does his like first diploma or whatever they're like, and it's like a year or something or three years, and he goes back home to Jaipur, and in Jaipur he meets a family friend who's like a kind of callow youth, like kind of 15 year old or 16 year old. Um, and he's like a much older, like 18 or 19 or whatever. Um, and his kid's like, oh, I really want to be, in f I want to make films. So um, he's just like an ordinary lad. And Cal's like, okay, yeah, go to the go to the institute where I studied, you know, and practice that. That's the best education you can get. And so kid goes, Cal goes back to Pune, where the institute is, IFT is. And he, re he sees, he sees his kid in a, um, in a bar and this kid has got a beard sunglasses smoking a cigarette and he's talking about Godard <laughs> and he's just like fuck yeah <laughs> this is great <laughs> this is so good second one is Uski Roti when that was released it was his debut film um, a no less than a member of the Indian parliament uh, called it he was delighted about this she was like the, it was the most boring film she'd ever seen in her life <laughs> And again, he was like, yes, my, my work is done. I'm like, I'm doing what I need to do. I'm boring people. And, and that's what I want to talk about. Like there's this 
pretentious not pretentiousness sorry wrong word there's this swagger mm. to the environment he was making films in which isn't yeah. immediately apparent in the surface of his films which are kind of generally uh tragic serious lyrical strange um but there's this real like cultural swagger about what he was doing and mm-hmm. i think he's very self-aware that he was just making quite cool films like there's a, a subcutaneous shimmer of of like absolute swagger with these films do, do you get that impression or am i um yeah no i mean i think the aesthetic is so distinctive it's the first thing you notice about a Manny Cal film the images are like beautifully composed but also like there's a fastness to the way they're put together mm. and, a, and a fastness to the way that things are seen it, it, it does refer back to the the statement he makes about about the camera somehow being a, an extension of the body i mean that's how i think when i pick up a camera I think let's start with Uski Rotti since yeah, you mentioned it right and it's his debut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very, it's on the face of it, kind of a realist story. It's a little bit like um, something like Bicycle Thieves, for instance. Mm, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the substance of the, of the story about this woman who brings bread to her husband, who's this working it's class very man. Everyday it's very everyday thing. And it, it, it's yeah. a, on the surface, there's this realist you expect it to be realist and yet what you experience as a viewer is something i would say like quite spiritual would you agree mm. yeah quite spiritual i think he eschewed like obvious narrative hooks and and temples so you're not given much context you have to piece a lot of it together mm. piece relationships together he's not doing um uh, obvious narrative arcs and structures. He's not signposting your way there. Because obviously we were talking about, we will talk about realism um, and how he was quite aghast at the idea. You know, he was quite opposed to the idea of a kind of a one-to-one mimesis between reality and film, almost as if it was impossible to try and achieve that. Um, and so Skirotti, it doesn't, you know, it starts with the, this woman, there's... Uh, uh, shaking of leaves there's fruit falling from a tree which a hand kind of collects it's quite of of those three films those three main films it's pr- perhaps the most composed in those gestures it's, mm. it's less naturalist there's a lot of um, uh, she looks directly into the camera um, the camera pans and a tree kind of blocks her view somebody's shoulder blocks her face it's very like uh, some miniature paintings like miniatures mm. and he did make a documentary about about miniatures right I don't know. I think so, yeah. I think he made a documentary later about... He made one about pottery, which you alluded mm. to, and then uh, he made one about miniatures as well. Mm. So, yeah, it's got this kind of dreamlike, hypnotic um, energy to it with these very fascinating cuts that we said are quite Brissonian, and they are, because there's got that, you know, the, the focus on knees and feet and hands, um, exchanges happening between hands. It's his most Bresson-influenced film. I think that's natural when you're making your first work for it to be the product of influence. Um, what I love so much about Bresson and what I love about this film is the way in which feeling is expressed th- entirely through material action. So the delivery in all of his films has this kind of clipped quality to it that people just say things and then, I, you know... Where, yeah, they're almost, it's not conversational. It's not a flow of linear conversation. Yeah. It's people almost making statements at each exactly, other. Yeah. Um, trying to communicate their feelings and we know through the clipped, uh, irregular, disrupted nature of their, their dialogue that the dialogue isn't the thing, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dialogue is failing its own task of kind of communicating what they're feeling. And so instead he uses material, like spatial planes, material objects to, and, and kind of transactions, like physical transactions to communicate the relationships. So, you know, in Uski Rotti, the, the husband, who's this kind of lay about kind of lad who mm. uh, obviously has no interest in his wife she just prepares this meal for him the daily bread right and he's spends a lot of time in the town um, he's gruff kind of a bit arrogant mm. when we meet him he's eating a meal in a like a hotel or boarding house mm. or something like and there's a photo on the floor which is obviously a photo of his mistress and the uh, he kind of picks it up and puts it carefully back in his wallet and the kind of waiter guy kind of smirks a bit <laughs> like it might be that in a way it's shocking because you know he know the waiter presumably knows that that's not his wife or whatever because mm. it's the local area um, wagging mouths and all that um, and it's quite that kind of scene communicates the fact that this is an impropriety in a way mm. and the guy doesn't really give a shit 
and there's just so much kind of packaged up in like things that aren't said mm. um, and we know there's turmoil and not necessarily in the husband but in a way there is because he's obviously like um in a way committed to his mistress because mm. it's a very loving way he replaces her photo in this um in his wallet mm. um <coughs> that's not covid by the way that's uh, vape um <laughs> yeah and it's that also, yeah. <laughs> and also the the way that the wife kind of carefully wraps this bread up and she's sitting by the bus stop to wait for him mm. like there's so much contained in like their relationship comes down to this bread that is the the kind of material fact of their relationship and that bread baked into that bread are the whole network of their their social relationship the community their love their history but he's not going breast on there's no voiceover going my husband's an asshole uh, <laughs> i have to bake bread from every day and it's really annoying and there's no character kind of you know, as our kind of Greek, there's no Greek chorus going, ooh, that's yeah, so and so's yeah. wife. We don't have that. Instead, we have these, yeah, these diacritical marks and these behaviours which kind of slowly um, and without resolution dip us into this world. I'm just going to bring up a quote. This is like one of those quotes that I tell people all the time and I may have, um, I may have said it uh, already. Passed it off as your own. Yeah, no, I never pass off. <laughs> I never pass any quote off as my own. But um, uh, Mike Skinner of the Streets says, <laughs> "He was going to be Mike Skinner." <laughs> <laughs> um, I think in the soap opera of life, if you describe the actions, the brain feels the emotions. And I think, like Uski Roti and a lot of Cal's work and and all of Bresson's work bear this out: a kind of fixation on factual descriptions juxtaposed in a way that we feel rather than the worst kind of art is art that tells you what to feel exactly or or, or over pathologizes yeah. the psychology that's at play yeah. because this is a psychological portrait in a way mm. um but is cluing us into it through um and and by that definition becomes a, a greater realism um than actual social realism you know mm. um because it accepts the liminality to use that very goldsmithy word um <laughs> it uses, like, accepts the liminality the, the fragility the uncertainty the irresolvability of of realism of the real mm. um because so much of it happens in our heads yeah. there's a really good discussion about skiroi in on one of the movie notebook episodes which we can probably link to we always mm. say we will and we don't but i will this time um <laughs> about the scene after she hands the bread over to her husband um, and she kind of walks across this field. She snags her foot on a branch. She places her hand on a tree. We hear a voice maybe laughing or it could be a bird. And it's mm-hmm. in that moment, she's entirely in her own head. And we're kind of not being shown the, her interiority. We're being shown how that interiority expresses itself in the world. Um, and that's what makes it so interesting because you're not being given a roadmap into these people's heads and lives. Because how could you? Because mm-hmm. everyone is an island almost that's almost what um Manny Cal is saying but he's not saying that in a cynical way like you can never understand another person he's saying you can but you're it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be resolvable with the films we've looked at there's a real sense of evolution mm. from this film in 1960 to Duvida in 1973 yeah, and yeah. into Nazar in 1990 I feel like Gattac gives him the confidence to make films about ordinary Indian people's lives yeah and then Bressel gives him the confidence to make a film in this very particular refined mm. style. Yeah, he kind of graduated from this anthropological style of filmmaking. Yeah. Not entirely, because like he still shows a concern with like an orphan girl mm. um, with with peasants, as it were, in in Duvida, um, or like kind of rural life. Mm. I mean, he said, he even said that in like uh, it, when he was in an interview, uh, early interview, he talks about uh, how when he was younger kind of making films originally he wanted filmmakers to do this to get, almost go like Narodniks to go into the countryside and to to embed themselves in communities it was like almost this like this like anarcho peasant like style of politics mm-hmm. rather than the kind of like more bourgeois politics of like um, Godard which was about disrupting the reception and perception of cinema this was more about you know you have to represent real stories which makes it realism you know mm-hmm. but I think he moved beyond that because like yeah, I mean, let's talk about Uski Rotti a bit more um, because it is, it is a tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which is like I mean they all are he, he seems singly oppressed with what you alluded to which was like um, uh, patriarchy mm. uh, tra- trauma uh, a, a failure of communication unhappy marriages longing longing need mm. desire un- unfulfilled desire yeah. right because the, wi- the wife is obviously um, cares deeply for uh, her husband who's obviously a, a fail son <laughs> he's just like he's just a slob and he's awful um, you know he's playing around on the side he doesn't care about her but she's completely devoted to him through this this act so Duvida mm. which is in glorious golden colour yes it's a folk it's a Rajasthani folk tale so it has certain principles of magic to it um, which are kind of shown in, uh, there was a wonderful interview I was reading with him uh, in that PDF that you sent me from the Kort- okay, Kortizan yeah. website yeah. Where, where he says it was it was important to, to present these aspects of magic in a way that completely ignored the question of them being real or not mm. it's, it's similar to Parajnov in a way like yeah. a presentation of like non-rational like fairy tale fantastical elements yeah. that was neither kind of excessive and and fetishized or like um awkward and strange and like, yeah there was there was none of the orientalizing uh magic that you'd expect to come yeah. in a way because it it's an understated so there's the the core of the story is about a ghost who falls in love with a young bride who's married to a wealthy well wealthy and aspiring simultaneously yeah. it's a bit confusing um merchant uh, certainly not a not working class merchant or somebody mm. who's up, upwardly mobile as we used to call it um, <laughs> and the ghost falls in love with her it's they've just been they've just got married mm. um, the husband then has to go away to the next town for five years <laughs> uh, to uh, open to look after the family shop and make his make his riches basically um, and he basically doesn't come back for four years or four years yeah so he, he goes off the ghost is like oh well this is convenient I can the ghost um, manifests himself as a as a double doppelganger of the husband and returns, mm. as it were, early, mm. and insinuates himself into her life. Now, the marriage she has with this merchant, she seems to have a genuine desire to want the marriage and to be happy with the merchant. The merchant seems largely indifferent to her. Like there's a scene at the beginning where she wants to stop their wedding cart to pluck fruit from a tree. Mm. Um, and again, fruit at the beginning of the film. Uh, food uses this kind of uh, this this like mirror into this like lens into people's emotions but mm. he kind of dismisses her desire it's peasant's fruit mm. he doesn't really want to stop even though this is clearly just like a, a kind of sudden infatuation she has with this fruit in this tree um, so it's quite, quite a telling thing he's not attuned to her, her needs mm. uh, ghost so ghost comes back husband, real husband is away ghost husband comes back kind of gives this like uh, kind of excuse for why he's decided not to go look after the family shop. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had a vision, basically. Yeah. And then the, for the next four years, the ghost lives as the wife's husband. But he admits to the he wife. He admits to the wife. He admits yeah. to the wife. He doesn't admit to, his, to the father, but he admits no. to the wife. Uh, and that's what's so beautiful is mm. that she she's like, fuck it, I'll do this anyway. Mm. Even when even when um, the ghost says it's not, he's not the. Um, not the, the real husband. guy. But yeah, because it's the the element of like consent, as it were. It's not like this. The story isn't setting up to be the ghost is this, the ghost is duplicitous. Yeah, obviously, but but not where it matters. Not where it matters, right? So he, yeah, he insinuates himself into the life of the village as her her wife. Time passes again, very peculiar in this. Mm. Um, uh, there's a lot of repetitions of scenes of framings. Um, it's. I guess because I guess it's a folk tale, and folk tales often make these kind of logical, illogical jumps through time and space because they need to. It's just mm. it forwards the kind of fable at the heart of it. Um, the real husband catches wind that something's not right mm-hmm. because some people from his village come to the town and they're like, hey, what are you doing over here? Like, I saw you the other day. Um, so he catches on that something weird is going on. He comes back to the village. So I'm just rattling through this story quickly. Comes back to the village 
confront he kind of tries to make his claim and it's this awful kind of like the the fear of the doppelganger of mm. not being the recognized doppelganger this this is very dostoevsky as well mm. because this is it's rajasthani but it's sorry not dostoevsky and this is goggle this is like the nose you mm. know where a guy's nose attaches itself from his face and assumes his life mm. and this guy's in terror because you know this this nose is living much better than he, have, he mm. is um so there's this, this fragmentation fear of like almost like this uh, castration fear or whatever mm. um and then there's basically a kind of husband, husband off where they both have to prove their um, their identity as the real husband, mm. which all kind of neglects the, the wife's actual feelings because yeah. she's fallen in love with the ghost. Mm. The real husband was never there for her. Um, she's pregnant with the Ghosts. ghost ghost baby. So, I mean, that's the film, you know, uh, blah, so, so on and so on. But yeah. it turns out that, you know, the ghost is found out through a, a wise shepherd's kind of nonsensical tricks they capture him in a bag chuck him down a well chuck him down a well so unfair uh yeah so unfair um because <laughs> he's good he's, he's like the friendly ghost but he and then the husband kind of resumes his real marriage with the wife yeah but obviously she lives her days in dutiful acceptance of this but not love yeah and she mourns the death of the or the disappearance of the ghost that she really loves um yeah. and he the husband lives in in kind of knowledge that he she doesn't love him yeah and so, the child is i mean i guess sort of the child will look like the husband because the child is the child of the of the ghost in though, husband form is is ghost come like does ghost come contain <laughs> well it's the not gonna the, DNA, the child's but... not gonna look like a banyan tree if you're a ghost and you manifest as a human being and then you impregnate someone you'll come temporarily that person's come yeah right but it's not like it's but it's not gonna i mean whatever like people do adoption all kinds of things but <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like um, this is what you listen to this podcast for which is uh, <laughs> deliberations on the, the realism of come goes natal come. ethics um, <laughs> <laughs> um no but i mean yeah that, that she knows that that's not her the husband's kid right it's yep. the ghost's kid and, and he knows this and he knows this yeah. and he's he's kind of cucked in a way right he's totally cucked he's, he's like a you know the, the ghost is the alpha yeah. um but it's it's interesting because like Uskiroti, there is a gain in character. Who, there is a longing and unmet need, mm. um, and again a an unhappy marriage. Again, formally, it's has this kind of uh, it's almost like objects and limbs are disembodied and mm. autonomous. Um, the narrative is more direct here of the films we watch because there is a voiceover, which is kind of backwards looking almost. Mm. Um, and it kind of tells a story because was, this was the first one I watched. So I had this impression that uh, there'd be more signposting with Manny Cow, how wrong I was. Um, <laughs> because it, cause it's a fable and it's a folk story. It kind of retains the the, the Greek chorus, as it were, of, mm. of the storytelling. Um, I mean, what? how do you feel that the two films kind of reflect like a kind of concentration of Manny Cow's aesthetics and style, formal practice, all that? I think that there is this fixation, as you say, on gesture and and a, and a wandering camera mm. that that I think moves intuitively. I don't I don't know exactly what his cinematographic practices were. I know that on Uski Roti um, there was there were two, only two lenses used, lenses, yeah. twenty eight mil and one hundred thirty five mil, so one quite wide and one very close, and obviously any of the shots you can tell which one is using which lens yeah, yeah it's pretty obvious. um and that just gives this that's just like a, a formal limitation which i think ensures a certain meticulous mindful quality to mm. the looking i think also duvida uses stills yeah in this way that feels feels somewhat commensurate to the folk tale uh qualities like a manuscript nature yeah. of this, like a static i mean it starts with these amazing close-ups of of the woman and the man and woman in this kind of horse drawn cart underneath these underneath this drape um there are these moments of like closeness and intimacy weaved with like larger landscapes i think there's some there's they both both films have this kind of closeness and wideness mm -hmm. thing we were sort of wondering whether or not to reference the use of stills as as a kind of like 
Chris Marker style. It's there, <laughs> to rise, but it's, it is there. There's something that it's does there. The, La Jete, oh. like, yeah, th- there is an element of it's not as totalizing as La Jete, yeah. but there's an interesting way how it, and sometimes it's not obvious that you've settled on it. There's one scene in particular where the cam- camera pans down. <laughs> Sorry. Choke on your red Take wine. Choke on my wine. Uh, where the camera was so excited by Cal. The camera pans down. Is that we see the woman's face and she is looking at us and mm. it's moving slightly, but the candle above her head is not moving. The flame is not mm. moving. So he, he, he at times blends these formats. This happened in Uskirotti. He switched how he used the lenses over the film, apparently. So the shots he sh- shot initially on 135, he switched into 28. And so he, he uh. or the, the, the scenes he would have used those particular lenses for, he switched uh, okay. halfway through the film. Um, to kind of create this ambiguity of seeing um, mm. and to create this autonomousness of the lens, I think. And you kind of get that here as well. Um, and a de-sequencing where it's a totally mm. different relationship to time. I mean, that's what mm. still, still do this, does this very, and it's, that's the whole point in La Jete. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's a time, still, time travel. Yeah, yeah, st- st- yeah, exactly. Like it's a film about time travel and stills do an amazing thing with time. And I think this mm. film, Divida, you know, time passes at once very slowly and at once very quickly right like three years three or four years pass in in the blink of an eye Um, yeah but then other moments it's very so when you really get a sense of the boredom of a wife who's like waiting for her yeah this rural existence even though it's only like an hour and ten minutes yeah i mean this yeah it's 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 similar we're saying before the podcast like it's simultaneously very uh thick gloopy film to watch almost it's mm-hmm. exciting to watch but it's it's moved very slowly within its 79 minutes or whatever mm-hmm. um there's the scenes where the ghost and the woman are the wife are the ghost husband are kind of having their falling in love i guess so to put it i mean it might be cultural context there's not that much physical contact at all mm-hmm. um there's a lot of scenes of them walking past each other maybe glancing at each other moving through the same space of this quite beautiful kind of palatial almost house um the camera tracking them through these corridors and courtyards um and that kind of even though it seems like that could have taken place in an afternoon it gives the impression that we're watching the unfolding of a lifetime almost mm. these four years of their love without having to say it and show it it just kind of takes it for granted almost um which is what we were saying earlier about this kind of non-linear time and this this sensual sensual time. And then one thing Manny Cal said in an interview, again, I think it's the same, this same big interview did. Um, and he talks about wanting to engineer a new sensuousness um, uh, to kind of, you know, he says even quite modern films that profess their modernism. I think he might be alluding to like even like the new wave in France, whatever. I think mm. he's kind of alluding to a bigger cinema, not just Indian cinema, kind of global cinema. Drags along the the social attitudes of years before, yeah, and still quite conservative um, in its. Uh, you know, it might use fancy camera shots, but it's quite in its sense shaping of time and space is quite conservative. Mm. And he's trying to engineer this new, this new sensuousness and a new sensual attitude, which is commensurate with how people really feel now. Yeah. Um, and that's really interesting to me because, again, like you said, it's sometimes hard to know exactly what he means by this. But he also said in another interview and he, it, it, that he saw that the, he said that the artist doesn't necessarily know what, they're, what purpose they're serving. Mm. Like you can have your manifesto, but in reality you're putting into practice things that you don't really know and you work it out through the doing. So yeah, there's, there's a sense of him being the instrument and the engineer and the instrument. Mm. Uh, this kind of super precision and also this kind of lossiness where, and it's good to accept that. You can just be like, I think it's just sometimes really ambiguous in his films. Mm. Like the, the shots and the pacing and the framing and the discontinuous narratives and these bits of voiceover, they just create this sensual bath and mm. that is more real because that's that's commensurate with our lived reality right like mm. especially obvious now during like this like the gruel of lockdown where <laughs> we kind of begin to lose track of time and space mm. a bit you know it's much more realistic our, 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 our inner monologue isn't a coherent narrative that delineates our psychological feelings at mm. any point it's a kind of mess yeah I mean I think the one thing I but I want to go on to Nazar, but just a, a shout out to how articulate and visionary Cal was in the way he talked about films mm. and filmmaking. 
um, and aesthetics and politics generally. I mean, he he speaks uh, on several occasions at length about the discovery of perspective, the Renaissance discovery of perspective, and how this led the way to cartography of a certain kind and therefore colonization. And he talks about Hollywood narrative structures. I mean, this mm. is sort of stuff... The only other filmmaker I've heard speak in these terms is Haile Gerima, the Ethiopian-American director, mm. um, who has a real sort of... Who looks at the Holly, Who takes on the Hollywood plot structure, narrative structure, act three acts, climax thing, and sort of has a decolonial critique of it. Manny Cowell as well, because he's got this real aesthetic sensitivity and he talks about the difference between representation and presentation. And he he says that really Bresson, he talks about Bresson and Ozu quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but really only these directors are following the the way of of presentation, of a kind of fragmentary cinema that is, that simply just shows things for what they are and does and doesn't attempt to create metaphors or represent it you know it doesn't it, it attempt to kind of use um cinematic devices you know it's like, yeah, this yeah. is the thing that you know it, hitchcock and eisen well, i was talking about this last week i was talking about maya darren you know like hitchcock and eisenstein um are both cinematic and innovators who use created devices within cinema that have been influential in the storytelling process and uh, and they you know they help us interpret plot all the time mm. montage cinema helps us interpret plot in almost every film ever you know since Battleship Temkin and and um Hitchcock's use, you know use of objects in the frame and the way that he generates suspense through through tricks of the eye and and kind of making certain people big and certain people small mm. and shadow and light and all of that stuff film noir as well like those devices um are part of the vernacular of of mainstream cinema in you know in the west and the east um but there's something irreplaceable about the poetry that you get from a film film by Bresson or a film by Tarkovsky mm. where the thing you see just is that yeah it's like meditation or something yeah and it invites you into the kind of the effect of it i mm. think it's not just serving a purpose it's not there to as a vehicle to serve yes. a purpose it is the thing itself yeah. this is very wittgensteinian um i think almost where yeah it you know because say country of a diary priest for example it, it is what it is mm. in a lot of ways um and the but we're not everything there is almost on the surface uh kind of spread out for us about this this priest's um illness in the world mm. um and actually one of the interesting parallels we saw there was the use of because you know Manny Cal is not and Bresson we're not averse to to symbols and metaphors entirely you know and um sick, physical sickness is a symbol for like a deeper undisclosed uh, existential angst is a really interesting one it's like mm. it's one that's like just literature always it's like someone's heartbroken they get sick they don't say I'm heartbroken they get ill mm. um, and it's something Manny Cow does because we'll see in Nazar um, illness of one form or another plays a role in in Duvida uh, the wife falls ill she she falls ill during um, pregnancy mm -hmm. so she has this very difficult complicated birth mm -hmm. um I don't know, maybe it's trying to give birth to a ghost child, I don't know. The, but, the red robes as they curl, I was watching it, my flatmate Keith was saying, um, we both actually, because it was quite pixelated on the stream, it looked a bit like all her guts were open. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Mine was a bit more focused. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was, on a, it like, was, it was just um, the red... Uh, the yeah. red robes kind of looked a bit like open heart surgery or something, which I, I think is like totally deliberate. But also he would yeah. never would have, I say deliberate, but then I've just said all this stuff about not doing like metaphor. No, but I don't, I don't <laughs> think he's like, I don't think he's, he's not doing metaphor as this signifies something no. else. This is the thing. This yeah, is yeah. what you've got. Because yeah, yeah. like I said, with the Skirotti, with the wife, having this extremely um, uh, self-absorbed moment walking across this field, we're not being allowed to look into the head. And she's mm. not saying her, passage across the field represents her 
alienation or her disappointment mm. or her tragic existential angst it doesn't it is what it is yeah, yeah. that's the, the surface is there for us to kind yeah, of yeah. pour through um but yeah there are there are kind of like things like you know there's these kind of more useful metaphors but you'll never be able to escape metaphor because ultimately cinema like any other art form uh bit photography you know uh, painting or whatever it's still representing a reality yeah, or it's absolutely. trying to a reality it's representing a reality but it's less engineered it's much less engineered even, like I said even while being very precise mm-hmm. and this is such nice gestures in, in Duvido you know when the ghost um, his husband returns to the village and gives this kind of slightly naff story to his dad he's like oh well <laughs> I helped um, a kind of uh, a holy man uh, wash himself in the river and he was like oh go home don't go to the town mm. um and the father doesn't really look at him he just waves his hand mm. and then that's the the action of acceptance yeah, yeah. but that in itself isn't a metaphor it's just showing the nest of relationships between father and son which the mm. father doesn't really give a shit yeah, yeah like um he doesn't really care there's not you know in in more conventional hollywood cinema that would be a point of narrative inflection. There'd be a debate where we'd learn about the father that doesn't care about him and the son trying to impress him. There would be dialogue. There would mm. be, look, we get a lot of shots at the eye of the face, you know, of like the, the Vox Pop, which is like dominates fucking Netflix mm. style drama now, which is just a continuous fucking Vox Pop mm. switching between, between people's heads and shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we're not getting that in a single gesture we're getting a whole life's history of relationships yeah. and expectations and failings and it's that's why it's so interesting so it manages to be this really fantastical film but fuck me that's real like mm. to be able to contain an entire relationship in just a single gesture mm. that's genius like that is really genius i don't that's that was that was when i seen that i was like wow like money cow is fucking shit hot like yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know maybe yeah, and like I said, you know, it's very Bressonian. Like, it's, he's watchable in the same way that Bresson is watchable, which mm-hmm. is kind of yes and no. Yeah, like yeah. difficult and not difficult. Yeah, you like, have to give it space and time. But yeah. then, when you've when you've done that, you've given yourself to it. It does. It stays with you, and it's it it's good for the soul. I think. Let's talk about Nazar. Yeah, yeah Nazar, nineteen ninety is a much more recent film. Yeah, um, and a much more like obviously modern film because mm. it's shot in a it doesn't disclose the location but we're in like a modern city right yeah, yeah, like because yeah. we see like tower blocks and mm. um uh again it's not much like establishing footage again which is really interesting we're just kind of often dumped into a room yeah you're indoors a lot of the time mm. the i don't i can't quite understand how good the color was, color was the color was so amazing it was literally like the best cinematography of yeah of a film i'd seen for years yeah it was truly truly spectacular every every shot was just fuck me that's insane it was like i watched it on two screens mm. uh, on a smaller one and a bigger one uh just because i wanted it i wasn't quite sure if watching it on a smaller screen was insane because it really concentrated yeah, yeah, yeah. the color in a really amazing way but it, it, it managed to be really saturated and desaturated at the same time yeah. certain colors popped and it's not like he's using like a fucking filter on after effects or something this is like no. just him Raw or film. his cinematographer just knowing how to use light and lenses which is the craft Absolutely of it it's amazing. amazing to make like it's luscious yeah. it's so good um, let's talk about so like tell tell us about so it's a pretty simple yeah. story it's another tragic story there's a an older man he's not you know he's middle-aged he's he's um an antique dealer mm. he lives with his aunt um right who's an older woman i never figured out who she was i assumed a sister or something yeah um and he's started dating or he has been dating for a long time this younger girl who when they meet is 17 she's an orphan um she's very beautiful uh they have this age gap romance <laughs> <laughs> she's the sugar daddy yeah um, um, she's sugar baby and they both on only fans <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm i'm, I'm puncturing the balloon he had a fun. podcast um, <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah it's very it's it's very simple. Basically, it starts with her. She's just killed herself. And then the film kind of goes back to look at the whole relationship. And then it ends where it begins, basically. Yeah. Um, it's not a satisfying relationship for her. It's not really... It's not satisfying for anyone. It's pretty sad. 
I don't really remember why or what happens, but it just, it was a world of pain. Yeah, there's the, the, the sense of kind of, whereas Uskirotti had a sense of dread. There is a sense of dread for Bernie Sun because in more obviously we know she kills herself and it's almost this who done it, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Like how what led up to this death. Um, we meet the character. The how done it. The how done it. <laughs> <laughs> the emotional um, who done it. Yeah, the emotional who done it. Um, the we meet the the husband at the beginning and he's pacing back and forth through this amazing kind of purple curtain mm. veil, um, kind of debating to himself in this slightly disjointed. Uh, non-synchronous voice about what's happened um, there's times when we're not sure if there's voiceover or dialogue and sometimes it's not immediately obvious and I, I, get, I assume he was doing that on purpose by this point because he's been making films long enough not to mm. like balls that up um, <laughs> but he yeah it's it's based on a a, um, a short story by Dostoevsky uh, The Meek One mm-hmm. um, so both of them are meek characters in a way mm. because the, he's you know this kind of bachelor um antique stealer who's who kind of attaches himself to her in an overbearing way she there's a girl 17 year old or whatever she comes to a shop a lot pawning objects and again that's another object kind of uh conveying deeper things you know why is she pawning this stuff mm. um obviously struggling financially whatever um and sh- she eventually kind of agrees to become his wife but it's very She's very unsure. Um, he's quite in in the story. And it's also obviously story. He's like this misanthropic kind of miserly character because he's a Dostoevsky like mm. protagonist. So of course he is. Um, in this, he's more thoughtful. Like he's mm. just, he's a bit myopic and a bit. He's a bit of a buzzkill basically. He's mm. just quite um, a bit narcissistic and kind of debating the meaning of life and kind mm. of talking about whether he's capable of evil and it's all these and it, so it's the the relationship isn't he's not a happy man mm. you know can can you be happy with an unhappy person mm. I'm not saying that's a denigrate because probably all of our listeners have got mental illnesses um, of one kind or another um, but you know it's almost a thing of you know this is not the making of a yeah. beautiful blossoming love story this is a strange thing and, and it's not like Manny Cowell ever says this is just a bad relationship because there's still moments of tenderness and understanding between them it's just complicated mm. um, and ultimately she seems to kill herself because as you know it's hard to again it's no obvious yeah there's no like, easy because I mean there's no, no easy because with any of Manny Cowell's films and that's kind of what's so amazing about them he's just deeply unhappy and can't go on yeah, I think, which is probably a better explanation for like how suicide actually happens. It's not like I'm killing myself because this. Yeah. Um, it's it's build up of unspoken things. There's there's the allusion to a kind of affair in the film. She starts seeing um, this guy that um, uh, the main character was in the army with years ago. But when you kind of catch them together, they're just hanging out and talking. Mm. So it's almost it's 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 kind of a betrayal, I suppose, in a way, or maybe alludes to a kind of sexual thing. It doesn't it doesn't bother to it doesn't need to actually because the ambiguity is because the husband doesn't know mm. the extent of their relationship and we don't know either. It leaves us in the it doesn't tie these like little narrative threads together actually, which makes it. I found this the hardest to follow. Yeah, actually, of all of them. Um, but there's le- I think there's less to follow. Or maybe I just didn't follow it. I don't know. It's hard. It was it's like, so. It was so gloopy. Really gloopy. It was just like shot after shot of total beauty. There were these mm. amazing sort of shots with mirrors or shots where the focus would shift between the tower blocks outside and the mm. faces indoors. It would repeat scenes. So yeah. he gets into a taxi, then he gets into the taxi oh, again, the and he scenes. gets into the taxi again, which is amazing. The jump cuts as well, amazing. Yeah. I just and it's just, the whole effect is this, when he said he was trying to engineer a new sensuousness, yeah. I think this is what he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. And by, these two people who can't communicate, let's put it yeah. in very simple terms, these two people cannot communicate, yet they've got some tenderness towards each other. Mm. That is a huge tragedy, because because they care about each other to an extent, mm. the, the gulf between their easy communication is yeah the, the the gap between easy communication becomes a fucking valley yeah um and we're falling into that valley again and again and again mm. and that's where we're existing in this dark the bottom of this dark ravine <sighs> um and that's why it's so powerful you know and it's just like yeah when he repeats those scenes i keep thinking of other people who've done that um i don't know if kislowski has done a, that before it feels, feels like i've seen that in kislowski yeah God, um, I, I feel like it's something filmmakers i'm not saying like he's it it 
I, I mean, it's it something le- we've all. Whenever you film something, you usually have multiple takes. Mm. And I mean, it's, it's something I've done in my work a little bit. Just use the revisit the, the same, not use another yeah. take. You, yeah, and it just sort of it it ex- <clears throat> you obviously can't do it too much because it sort of becomes too much of a device. But yeah, he doesn't do it enough to make it become like a cliche of itself. It's yeah, a I mean, few times cre- where it happens, he creates a setting and a start an aesthetic where it feels totally. Because I think appropriate. it seems appropriate because we see when he gets into the taxi, he's about to. They're reconciled after um, her seeing this other guy, mm. and they've kind of had this moment of. Exp- he's tried to explain himself. He left the army in um, uh, controversial circumstances. He um, refused to eat. He went on hunger strike. Mm. And left, and he kind of uh, makes these. He kind of explains his thinking, but he doesn't. Again, it's an unresolved. He doesn't say, "I did it because of this." Mm. Um, he uh, alludes to like the Sepoy Rebellion in 1857 where um, uh, Hindu um, soldiers if I remember correctly they refused to use the ammunition that the British had given them because it was covered the the, the, the bullet casings were covered in pork fat so oh, wow. you had to tear it with your teeth it's because uh, they wouldn't eat sorry not pork uh, cow uh, beef dripping that's it yeah right. so they wouldn't eat it because it would have been cons- consuming it so it was like against you know it was against their principles they wouldn't do it so there was a mutiny and rebellion so he kind of tries to allude to it through that but doesn't and again mm. it's this kind of that might be his own justification what happened we never know what happens and yeah. again that's what's so unresolved and beautiful about it because we don't really know um, and he gets into the and they agree to go on holiday to Goa so I go to the coast and get some sun mm. um, and he's going in a taxi to get passports or something mm. Um and it's almost like, you know, sometimes you remember particular moments in your life. It, mm. it doesn't feel momentous or it does. Mm. It's almost like this is a momentous moment for him because mm. it's this moment of hope because he's like, oh, mm. fuck, yeah, we're going to go to Goa and maybe our marriage can be happy and work. So that's the narrative kind of gives us that a couple of times mm. to show that it's something that's really on it, flowing around his head. It's amazing. I don't know. It's just, yeah. it's so good. Frustrated um, desire. I mean, it, I, yeah. I think of Roma like something about we something about Mary yeah it's got a lot of parallels to something about Mary <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't actually seen that film oh, um, it's, it's, Cameron it's okay. Diaz yeah Cameron Diaz <laughs> Is Iconic. that the one with the cum? And cum, the yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, right. so <laughs> now, that. talking about um, uh, kind of narrative devices to make your film memorable <laughs> more beyond the lifetime of the film, there's one. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah. so, so, I remember when we were talking about Roma yeah. with Igor, because Bresson does close-ups a lot, and, yeah. and Roma never does close-ups. What I'm trying to say is, like, they both have this, tr- this treatment of objects. Uh, it, with Roma, it's more about spaces and contexts. But they both have this way in which the people in the frame are not necessarily the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I the think hierarchies. that's that like that works really well with the with Duvida as well, where in fact like a ghost who was a banyan tree then becomes a person. Like that feels like that sort of manifests mm. uh, in a more total sense. Um I actually it actually Duvida this is a bit of a detour, but um Duvida really made me think about um Darius Merzel's film that was on movie about a year ago. I don't remember this one. It was, you really loved it. It was Did called I? The Cow. Was it? God, was it even called The Cow? No, it was a... Partic- Did I go off about this film? You really went off about completely. it. <laughs> it's a black and white Iranian film. Oh my God, yes. About um, a guy that becomes this animal. Yeah. It is a cow, right? It is a cow or something. He becomes... It's an Iranian a, film. Yeah, yeah. He, be- yeah. He, be- he thinks he's become the cow. and in, It goes mad. Yeah, he, he goes becomes... Mad. He's confronted with something in his life and he has his psychic trauma yeah, and yeah, yeah. believes he becomes a cow. Yeah. And I he just hangs out with the cow in the cow area. Mm, the cow area. <laughs> Wait, no, the cow disappears. And he... Hang- yeah, that's it. He's in love he with his cow. He's in love with his cow. It's killed by somebody. It's, it's Yeah, I and think. they pretend that it's just gone missing. Yeah. And instead of sort of telling him, they just say it's gone missing. And so, but instead of ex- accepting that it's gone, he just sort of goes into the place where the cow was and becomes and sort a cow. of becomes a cow he yeah. kind of has this mental breakdown where he spirals into this this safe safe space and it's like it's, it's sort of simultaneously a fairy tale and also like a film about madness that's such a good film fuck yeah that's a really good film we and it's so out. it's similar yeah. to Vida. it's like a yeah. sort of a folk a village folk fairy tale that sort of encompasses madness and longing mm. 
um, and also transcends the the boundary between object and person. Yeah, in a similar it, it way to muddies Bresson and the Roma. waters in all of these ways. Yeah. Like, so I think we said which is something cinema, I think, can at its most transcendent cinema does, and that's mm. what that's the spirituality of Tarkovsky because Tarkovsky of yeah. course is like very Christian but I think the spirituality that we feel is that we feel like the ditch that mm. the bald guy is like lying in mm. is like is a person I don't want to yeah. come across all Timothy Morton but like, <laughs> shout out to Timothy yeah, Morton anthropomorph- <laughs> like, anthropomorphizes the the world and things in it I think and, and lends agency yeah, to yeah, objects yeah. it's like Alfred Gell approach to you know the, the, the agency of objects but more than um, that, I guess that. another way, of, you just you just feel that there's a spirit everywhere. Yeah. You feel yeah. spiritual. Yeah. I mean, Tarkovsky cinema is imbued with like yeah, a a deep resonant spirituality. Yeah, Everything yeah. is every the way he links over a, a you know a painting, the way he mm. slowly tracks and pans along a river. Yeah, completely. It's like, and here with with Manu Cow, the same the same thing is kind of happening. It's mm. a lot more threatening than Tarkovsky because Tarkovsky is all, all about generosity, I think. Mm. There's a deep generosity, a warmth of spirit in mm. all Tarkovsky films, even the darkest ones. There's, they're imbued with this reaching out. Mm. Whereas here, I think Manik is a bit more modernist in a way because there's, there is social alienation. It's kind of pushed to the front. We're not looking at the artist's spirit, which is what we're looking at with Tarkovsky. We're looking mm. at kind of like, yeah, kind of social, social anomie and things like that. But I think... Because we're talking about Gattak, Richard Gattak, and obviously his his teacher. And while there's not, uh, we we're both watching um, Snow, the uh, Cloud Cat Star yeah. uh, from 1960. Um, Probably Gattak, Rit- Rit- Gattak's most famous film. Most famous, yeah. And we we didn't finish it, but there's some amazing scenes in there. Did you see the scene with the the kind of elliptical lens where we get the woman in the foreground walking? She looks over to a man in the middle ground who's singing by the river. Oh, yeah. And then we get the train Stunning. coming and they're all converging on this point and this playing with composition in this really exciting way kind of um, manages to kind of collapse the frame and also expand it infinitely. I mean, that stuff felt so kind of... That felt kind of... I think once you've seen Cowl, that stuff doesn't feel... It was very beautiful, but I... I it's a lot colder. Yeah. yeah. It, made, it made me feel like... Um, because then it, beca- it it does things like that, and then it just becomes a film about it comes family. Comes again, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah whereas whereas, whereas Cow's Cow's film like, stays in this, that register. Yeah, completely. He's like, he's 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 not you know kind of using these devices here and there, mm. um, because I guess Gattak was still kind of um, still kind of owed himself to a kind of like conventional dramatic narr- narrative. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas you know. Um, he, you know, Gattak walked so Cal could run, I guess. Cal's yeah. like, yeah, like you said, I'm, the whole film is this register. This is the reality. There's not like art, arty, farty moment and then normal uh, melodrama. Yeah, it's like, yeah. no, it's all there. It's all up in the kind of rarefied, strange Because place. it has a philosophy. Um, it's not just yeah. being like beautiful for a bit. It's like really rigidly adhering to an aesthetic principle. Yeah. And I think that's really, I think that as filmmakers, like that's something you always have to, like wake up when you mm. when you see stuff being made in that in that way like it's yeah, you have to snap awake because it's it, it it's doing what antonioni was trying to do mm. uh thousands of miles away in italy for italian bourgeoisie yeah but with with antonioni it's all empty yeah um you know, it, yeah, it's, it's uninviting, spiritless, isn't it? it's spiritless, it's godless. and there's no, there's no philosophy of Antonio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's just, he is the, the harbinger of doom for the Italian bourgeoisie. He's showing <laughs> the bourgeoisie their own decimation. Yeah. Um, whereas with Cal, it's way more interesting because he's like, he's a proper artist. Like we didn't even get a chance to talk about his, his, his indebtedness to music and to Indian classical music. Yeah, to, he made a whole film about the Drupad. Drupad and his, his belief in Struti, which is like the the tuning of um, particular forms of rag and Drupad music mm. and the idea of of kind of improvisations off of off a of form like there's mm. all these things that he was he talked about massively at length mm. which we could you could have a whole podcast about like we're going to talk about like the musical influence on on Manny Cal's films it's there he's, yeah, it's, yeah. He, just to say it's like you know he's got this interest in these t- tone and silence and in kind of tuning along these kind of um, Formula, you know these kind of formulaic musical measures did you get a chance to have a look at any of the other films in fragments in fragments yeah, yeah. There's the, the one about clay i think the the 
Mind, it, Mind, of, Mind Clay. of Clay. That's really stunning. I mean, these are films that aren't really very easy to get a hold of. I mean, I have a Caragago account, so I was able to source them. <laughs> listeners, listeners who feel bold, email me. I'll send you the files. Yeah, um, reach out. But yeah, there's an erotic film that I greatly enjoyed. I greatly enjoyed. Do I greatly enjoy these live bodies? <laughs> 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 um, called the Cloud Door. Um, I saw some of that. Yeah, Cloud Door. Is that the one that began begins with these quite big sweeping landscapes and there's like a sea? No, that's um, is that. Uh, before my eyes. Before my eyes. Wow. Fuck me. The bits I saw of that were insane. That was so insanely beautiful. It's like the Solaris planet scene, yeah. but real. And there's a great yeah. scene. That, <laughs> there's amazing. a great scene that makes me that looks like something. It's just straight out of, out of Tarkovsky. Like it just is. So, and that to me, like it, people that know me, like Tarkovsky is the pinnacle of cinema for me. He's so a king. Like, yeah, he's a king. It was like a shot that was. I mean, it wasn't like Tarkovsky imitation. It just had. It was like god level stuff. Um, he, it's yeah. a shot of a, of a cellist, uh, and the shot just pan. She's in like a little wooden wooden kind of cottage, and then the shot yeah. just pans out to the window. Amazing. Uh, there was something he said about he he liked that Tarkovsky quote about imitation. Mm. You know, when we're um, Tarkovsky's talking about Bresson, mm. um, and Tarkovsky says, "Well, um, when you begin to imitate someone you like." Um, you're kind of doing the wrong thing. It says, I'm not trying to, when I like a shot by Bresson, I don't try and recreate that shot. I try and e like enter the mind world of Bresson and try and make mm -hmm. a Bresson film. It's yeah, not yeah. about going, oh, he kind of does these shots, so I'll do these shots. It's actually, it's it's an imitation that's kind of a, a remove. It's having a methodology. So, yeah, it's, uh, what is it, he Hexis, like the, you know, from the, the, the um, Roman oratorical thing. It's 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 not direct imitation. It's learning the kind of worldview and patterns of that person. So it's a bit more a remove, which yeah. is why you know you can say about Cal that he's kind of like Bresson, um, but he's not just copying Bresson because that would be boring and we wouldn't remember Manny Cal. Yeah, he he know. did what Bresson did, which is think for himself. Hmm. He didn't do on films we're here this is independent thought radio <laughs> um, where free Didn't speech <laughs> free speech has no safe space i hope no one cuts that out <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> listeners um listeners we we love manny cal we do don't we <laughs> and, and manny cal is a is a is, is an under represented director in the yeah. he's not in the canon no. Uh, I'm not. I don't know if that's because of colonialism or racism, or whatever. I, but it's it's important. That, it's important that he cinema, is right? that he is seen. I think mm. if you are like I was as a teenager, you know, getting curious about Antonio and you getting curious about Bergman. The wrong people into, to get know. curious about some of these at that age. <laughs> this is a much better. Manny Cow was a much better. Uh, in, inspiration I think that would possibly have been best for the soul at that age soul, yeah. when you really need it because Antonioni you can learn like everyone sees like Luchise and stuff mm. and it's like oh cool I really want to make these I really want to be jaded biting <laughs> jaded films about the bourgeoisie and you're actually like and, and the coldness but here you're learning about intimacy and, and, and kind of um, ambiguity in a really interesting way yeah um, the difficulty of making a thing that is ambiguous and still engaging because mm. uh, ambiguity can be really off-putting yeah, it's but I think the feeling is not ambiguous at all. The feeling is really strong, and that's it's razor sharp. Yeah. Whereas I think in Antonioni, the feeling is often the thing that's ambiguous. I I, I would really love some some uh, Antonio to come on the movie because oh no, I'd love to. I want to get my would, teeth into. We should, we should, I mean, that would be a real revis revisitation for us. Red Desert yeah. movie. If you're listening, let's get some Red Desert in here. Watch Monica Vitti just. Um, yeah, Monica Fitti. Monica Fitti, just be hot in uh, full Technicolor. Um, Home Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Vitti Patel. Vitti Patel. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> that'll get the file out under Udo Kiyostama. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I kind of want to talk to you about the, his version of The Idiot, but neither We'd of us have, have time to be. Have I, how long have we it. run? How long have we run? We've done basically now. Um, um, I, I think it's interesting that he did, like, one aside, like, that he did get he was so drawn to Dostoevsky it's yeah. really interesting because Dostoevsky was all expression mm. um, and all uh, absurd dialogue rambling dialogue uh, it's a really interesting like person for um, Manny Cal to have turned into a really underplayed subtle mm. um, yeah it's quite the paradox you would have yeah. more thought he'd go for someone like Tolstoy yeah 
Um, well, more more like Akhmatova or, or mm. um, Boris Pasternak in his early years, that kind of thing, where it's all much more... I mean, now you're saying things I don't understand. I sure, in it. <laughs> um, I love Russian literature, but I, you've read a lot more than I have. Thanks. It's, it's, it's bad for the soul. <laughs> it's Is that not a to compliment me. to say someone's read a lot of Russian? I don't know. I don't, when, when people say that, it's... How do you? Because how do you feel if like someone gave you a compliment? Like Ralph, you've watched loads of films. I mean, people say it to me all, all the, the time. time. But <laughs> how do you feel when people say that? Um, I think the nature of having seen a lot or read a lot or listened to a lot of something is that you are so much more attuned to your own ignorance. Mm, so the more yeah, films true. you see, the more you're like, oh well, I haven't even seen anything by that director. I haven't seen anything from yeah. that country. Well, discovering someone like Manny Cow, yeah, know, I feel fit to bursting with like stuff to say about Manny Cow. Yeah, in. maybe do you want to do a little Substack, a little subby? Yeah, I might have maybe. to do a Substack yeah, actually because I think also this is about raising awareness. I don't want to be, I don't want to get political here, but we should. people it's, should people should know about Manny Cow. He is an extraordinary. He's director. not on the Criterion Collection, which is supposedly the gold Stop. standards of. Um, and and, and Gatak H- is on. Uh, and Gatak, one, yeah, one film by Gatak is Cloud Cap Star. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he should be on the Criterion Collection for sure. It's a, it's just about a lack of awareness. I mean, I first heard about Manny Cow through Mark Cousins' story of film, which I have to say, mm. much as much as. Um, Cousins has now become a kind of a bore of the Swintonati. <laughs> um, that the, that fifteen hour um, history of cinema was a real eye opener for me, and it's a great great resource. In a while, um, but yeah, uh, and so I did. Yeah, I did get into Cal a few years ago, but this movie revisitation has been. Yeah, movie sometimes comes up with gold. Like it really does. There'll there'll be a month of like quite meaningless this like kind of film festival bump yeah yeah and then you'll get like just like Romero and and Cow at the moment it's just like such an enticing like double bill and actually um in the UK uh Girlfriends and Boyfriends has just come on movie yes so we we reviewed it a little bit ahead of time so um it's now on movie so if you want to go and watch that because otherwise it's on BFI yeah we highly recommend you watch all the Roma and all the Cowl and whichever film we choose to review next week. <laughs> whatever film. We're we done. Decided. Like, how do we beat this? <laughs> Time for some more red wine. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Stay safe. Happy lockdown. Bye.